Hello everyone, thank you for coming. It's nice to finally be here at the Santa Fe Institute, a place that I've heard about for quite some time. Uh, as Ken said, my name is Jeff Kloon. I'm at the University of Wyoming and I am the director of the Evolving Artificial Intelligence Lab there. So before, we actually have a double, double header. I'm going to tell you about two different projects. But because I'm going to be here for a few days, I wanted to give you a preview of some of the research that I won't have the ability to talk about in case you're interested in those subjects and want to meet and talk about them. But Jeff, I, I should have mentioned that you, I want to just make, make it clear that Jeff will be here in, through Wednesday. And you should feel free to stop by either my office or Jeff um, if you want to talk about anything. But so please remember that Jeff's around to be able to talk about this. Yeah, great. So the first project I'm not going to tell you about, except in brief, is a paper that I had with uh, Charles Afria and Rich Lensky and Santiago Lena, who's actually formally affiliated with the Santa Fe Institute. And that is on, and the conclusions are all basically expressed in the title, and that is that natural selection fails to optimize mutation rates for long-term ad adaptation on rugged fitness landscapes. And so you could basically um, ask the question, if I went through and I picked a specific mutation rate and did not let it evolve and just fixed it, and I use, in this case, we use computational simulations of evolution, uh, specifically the Avita system, and I lock that mutation rate in and I run it for a very long period of time and I record the final fitness, I can then plot fitness on this axis, and I can do that for a series of mutation rates, and what you will find is that there's an intermediate mutation rate that is optimal for long-term adaptation. And then the question is, we know that the evolution, evolutionary um, gets to control its mutation rate in nature. So given that mutation rates evolve, will evolution kind of discover this optimal mutation rate? And as you can guess from the title, the answer is no. So here's the actual data. Black is when you go through and you fix the mutation rate at these different uh, levels. These are or orders of magnitude, different mutation rate. And we can find that this mutation rate here is what produces the long-term optimal high, uh, fitness over the long haul. And then if you start evolution at a high mutation rate or a low mutation rate and let it choose its own mutation rate, basically what will happen is it'll go right through the optimal and settle on a very low mutation rate and get a very low fitness compared to what it would have had if it had chosen the long-term optima. And same also if you start low. So basically evolution is not good at controlling its own evolvability, at least in this dimension. And that's all sure and I think that's short-term fitness evolution is short-sighted it doesn't think long term and in the short term we do a lot of experiments in the paper to show that there are short-term directions pushing the mutation rate down and it's only if you could lock that in then you get to pay attention to the long term and get the long-term benefits there are other projects we have on the evolution of altruism, specifically green beards, and also uh, Evo Devo issues. And these stories are too complex to summarize in a slide or two, but let me know if you're interested. Ken mentioned deep learning. I'm getting fascinated by this. Uh, basically, for decades, we've wanted artificial intelligence to work, and I would argue that it only really started to work within the last couple of years, thanks to deep learning. And what's happening is we're taking huge neural networks, computational models of brains with hundreds of millions of connections in them, and they learn, according to relatively simple algorithms, to do a variety of astonishing tasks, from translating from Chinese to English or Spanish to uh, Hindi live, to recognizing the sounds that I'm saying and turn them into English words, to looking at a picture and saying girl in pink dress jumping in the air, or dog, black and white dog jumping over a bar, or sitting them down in front of a video game with no feedback except a score, and the, game, the, the algorithm figures out how to play this game, which is a very difficult reinforcement learning problem. And the same algorithm basically is doing all of this. And that is pretty amazing. And that's the field of deep learning. And one of the things that we've discovered is that while they're very good, these networks, at seeing the world and recognizing what they're seeing, they also still behave very bizarrely if you move the types of images you ask them to label a little bit away from their training set. So here are kind of synthetic images that we produced that the deep neural networks say with absolute certainty, effectively 100% certainty, this is an 8, this is a 4, this is a cheetah, and this is an electric guitar. And it's, it's certain of it, as certain as it could be. Uh, and so there are some interesting gaps and differences between the way that these networks are seeing the world and the way that humans see the world. And that exposes some interesting research to, to close those gaps and also reveals some security holes that could be exploited because of these discrepancies. Uh, another cool thing about these networks is that they used to be considered black boxes. 
you didn't really know how they worked. We just knew that they worked. And uh, my colleagues and other teams are starting to develop teams to basically shine light into these black boxes and figure out what are these networks learning and how are they solving these amazing tasks that they're solving. So we can actually go to one of the neurons, the neuron that, that reports school bus, and we can say, what image do you maximally react to? Uh, same thing with pool tables or black swans or tricycles. And we can basically learn what does that neuron compute, what function. And you don't only have to do that with the final output neurons, which is what these are, but you can do that throughout the entire network. So these are layered networks that increasingly um, put together abstract features. So they start with edge detectors, which you can see down here. Then you have corner detectors, and then you have wheel detectors, and maybe an insect detector. This is the equivalent of me going into your brain, picking a random neuron, and finding out what does it do. And we can start to do that with these neural nets, with these new techniques, and start to visualize and understand these amazing networks. Again, that's all work that I don't have time to tell you about. One more thing I don't have time to tell you about is uh, transfer learning. Because these networks go from very simple generic features like edge detectors all the way up to specific things like what should I do in this particular Atari game, that means that there's a transition from general to specific. And that means that some of this stuff will be useful on many, many problems. So we can do something called transfer learning where I train on the red task, where I have a lot of computation and a lot of data. And then I might have a new problem I want to solve really quickly or I don't have a lot of data. So I'll just basically chop off the network. I'll save all the stuff that I learned on another task and I'll just retrain the very end of the network. And this turns out to work very well. And in this paper, which was at NIPS this year, we quantified basically the transition from generic to specific. How reusable are these features in these networks? So all of those are the projects I'm not going to tell you about. The first thing I'm going to tell you about, there's two, two acts to this talk. The first one is work that I've been doing since my dissertation, which is trying to evolve structurally organized neural networks. Uh, so I've been working on this a long time. And the, the way that I go about this is I create evolutionary processes inside of a computer. You can think about it as a simulation of evolution. And it obeys the same rules as Darwinian selection. You have a population, there's mutation, there's selection uh, over time. And my goal is to try to evolve things as complex as jaguars, hawks, and the human brain. Spoiler alert, we're not there yet. We're not anywhere, anywhere near. We can't get this to work. And that actually, to me, is very exciting because it, it basically raises the question of what are we missing? What aren't we implementing in these computational simulations that's out there in the natural world that makes it so amazing, nature, at producing all the diversity that we see? So I have two motivations for this long-term quest. One of them is, as Feynman said, I do not understand that which I cannot build. We understand things by trying to build them. So we understand how natural evolution produces diversity and specifically how a jaguar might move about the world by trying to recreate it. The other motivation is engineering. If I could have robots as agile and graceful as jaguars, I could do a lot of beneficial things for society. So what are the key ingredients? What aren't we putting in our simulation that is producing this explosion of diversity in the natural world? I'm going to focus on three today. There are many. But I'm going to focus on three particular ones that I've spent a decade looking into. And that is regularity, modularity, and hierarchy. So I'll do those in order. We'll start with regularity. That is basically reusing information. So if I take the information on the left half, I reflect it onto the right half, I get more of my image basically without much in extra information. And if you look at nature, natural creatures are extremely regular. All of us are effectively left-right symmetric for the most part. Even this fiddler cloud, which is like a paradigmatic example of irregularity in nature because there's some information that says that these two things should be different. It's still pretty regular. It's mostly left-right symmetrical. You have these repeating legs. The same cell unit is repeated over and over again. So what we want is to get this regularity into our evolutionary algorithms. So uh, I've mentioned evolutionary algorithms a lot. I'll tell you a little bit more about them. So you're primed for the talk. The general idea, if I want to evolve something using evolution, the first thing I have to do is I have to decide how to encode it. So if I want to evolve tables, for example, I could say I'm going to specify the length of each leg separately, and then the width and the length of the surface of the table. Once I have this kind of decided encoding, I can randomly put numbers in here that will give me one table. Randomly pick other numbers, that gives me a second table. I can get a whole population of tables by randomly picking numbers. Then I can score them maybe by putting them in a simulator and seeing um, how, they, how, they, how well they hold up my coffee or something. I take the best ones and I just repeat this process until I get better and better tables. Now, in terms of getting regularity into these phenotypes, I'm going to focus on the encoding here, because that turns out to be critical. So an encoding is how you store information in a genome. 
and the process by which you take that information and turn it into the final form or the phenotype. And I already showed you one type of encoding, which is called the direct encoding, where every part of the genotype specifies a different part of the phenotype. So here I'm specifying the length of each leg separately. And if you think about how mutations affect such a direct encoding, they're going to produce really irregular forms. It might actually be very difficult to go from this local optima to this local optima because I have this fitness valley of this irregular leg and selection is going to keep pushing me back to this phenotype. I could also have a generative encoding, which is when I take information and I allow that information to be reused throughout the phenotype. For example, I could specify the length of legs once and just make all the legs that length. And then it becomes trivial, actually, to go from this table to this table. So how this information is represented is going to affect the mutational cloud and the search space that we're operating in. So I'm interested in generative encodings because I think regularity is important, not just to repeat something like a Lego block, but to repeat it with variation. So if you look at these hands here, you can basically see the same motif is elaborated, but with slight variation. It's like a parameterized design, uh, which is very important. So, how does nature get regularity into organisms? This is one of, I, one of the coolest things I think that happens in the universe. You can take one cell with one uh, piece of software, put it, you know, and it basically will grow into a cypress or a hawk or a jaguar or a three-toed sloth. And it's pretty incredible because within a multicellular organism like yourself, you have eye cells, spleen cells, heart cells, and skin cells. They're all running the exact same software, same DNA, but yet every cell knows what type of cell to become. How does that pat patterning process, how do cells know what to become? Well, it turns out that effectively, and this is a bit of a caricature, but cells want to know their XYZ coordinates. If I know where I am in space, then I know I should, oh, up, I'm up here, I should be an eye cell. I'm down here, I should be a heart cell or spleen cell or whatever it is. So, this is a cartoon by Sean Carroll, a developmental biologist, and it shows how this works. So this is the Drosophila embryo. This is the, actually the same embryo, three different pictures, showing three different chemicals that are sitting in that same embryo. And this gene is going to say, turn on, make a new chemical, only if A is present and B and C are not present. Now the only places that's true in this embryo are in these little squares here. And effectively what's happened is that this gene has taken three pre-existing geometric patterns and combined them to produce a new geometric pattern and this pattern could be used to specify where vertebra should go, a repeating element down the center of the spine, for example. This is an actual picture of a esophageal embryo. You can see there's a head to tail gradient, which is blue to red. I can tell if I'm in an even or an odd segment by whether or not I'm in one of these green bands, etc. And if you look through developing pictures of developing embryos and you stain the chemicals the right way so you can see these transcription factors uh, and these morphogens, that basically these geometric patterns are the lingua franca of developmental biology of specification. It's how all of the cells in your body figure out where they should go and what they should become. So the question is, how do we get all of this mess into computer simulations? Yeah. That's true, but I would argue that the feed-forward states primarily are to set up the pattern that other cells then listen in onto. Now, there are some organisms that have certain kind of internal clocks, and a lineage is actually going to kind of, uh, and, uh, C. elegans is one of them. But most cells, I think, if you took the cell out, you erased its history, put it in the right condition, it would look at the pattern surrounding it and know what to become. That's true. Both things, are, both things are coming together. I would almost use the stem cell uh, magic that's happened in the last few years to go the other way and say so we say with a little bit of resetting I can take a cell from over here, put it here, and then it does become the right thing. But both things are at work. The clock and the geometry. I, I agree with you. So I'm going to ignore that part, the temporal unfurling, and just focus on the geometric pattern because I think that gets us a long way there. And I'm not claiming that I'm perfectly representing biology. I'm trying to steal some of the power and secret of biology and get it into our algorithm. The question is, how do I do that without paying the computational cost of simulating all these diff diffusing morphogens and all these gene regulatory networks? And Ken Stanley actually is the one in my mind that had the big breakthrough. He's here. Uh, you guys are lucky to have him here at SFI. In 2007, he came up with this idea of a compositional pattern producing network. 
And that is going to basically take nature's trick. I'm going to encode the, what happens to certain parts of the phenotype as a function of where they're located in geometric space. So here's how it works. Imagine if I want to evolve a picture. I can give every pixel on the canvas Cartesian coordinates. And I can literally take the coordinates and put them into this function here. So here's 1 comma 1. I'll ask the network what should happen at 1 comma 1. I literally put in the numbers 1 and 1. It does some math based on those numbers, spits out an answer, and that's my grayscale value. Then I can take 1 comma 2, 1 comma 3, 1 comma 4, etc., and iteratively ask this genome what should happen at every location in this canvas. And if this function is random, I will get a random picture. But if this function is a network of math functions, and the math functions have properties that I want, such as left-right symmetry or repetition, I've now given evolution, which is mutating in nodes and changing connections, kind of a palette and a building block set to mix and match these geometrical patterns. For example, if I want left-right symmetry in this organism, I can have everything immediately pass through a Gaussian of the x-axis and be a function of that downstream. If I want repetition in the y-axis, I can make it a sign of y. I can put these things together. I could create an exception by using the linear function and only do something when x is between a range of variables, et cetera. So Ken, to see what would happen if I evolve images with this network, built this website called PicBreeder, which you guys can all go play with. And people get on the website and they breed pictures as much as you would breed dogs or roses. I like this one. I like that one. And this is what happened. And when I saw these images as a PhD student, I dropped everything I was working on and changed the entire focus of my dissertation to start working with this because it was the first time in my life that I was starting to see a hint that we were starting to capture some of the power of evolution and developmental biology. To me, especially from the back of the room, some of these things look natural. This looks almost like an eye. Uh, you see left-right symmetry. You see repetition. Here is a lineage. And you can see the mutations aren't producing scrambled, uh, a scrambled mess. They're well, actually the producing. The functions that produce these were intended to produce something like that, or was it a surprise? So there's been seven years of research into that exact question. Uh, the short answer is that people come to the website, they pick something like this, and they say, I like it, I want to evolve it further. And they just go off in some random direction. They may have a goal in mind, they may not. They may have a goal and then see something uh, serendipitously and then go in another direction. And collectively, the crowd produced all these images. So this is a lineage that some human actually took. But I can't tell you whether or not they set out to make a bat when they started at a butterfly, or if they just found it surprising when they got there. Crowdsourced Crowd exploration of the, space, of the fitness space of these images and these networks. That's right. And it turns out Ken has invented a whole new algorithm that's revolutionizing our field that I'm not even going to mention today that stemmed from the result that oftentimes you can actually pick a distant goal and go there. It is a lot of serendipity. It is a crowd kind of playfully exploring the space without an overall objective. But that's a story for another day. So the, the serendipity is going to be a permanent feature. We are trying to algorithmically capture that. In fact, I just submitted a paper on that. If you can capture how to not have an overall goal, but locally recognize quality when you see it, recognize the serendipity of this discovery, and go in that direction, collect stepping stones in every direction, that we think is a key to the diversity production of nature. So, so you will end up with algorithms rather than crowdsourcing. Yes, crowdsourcing we're trying to. Yep. Stage you're going that's right. A paper that I have under review right now is trying to algorithmically capture the magic that happened on Ken's website to get the humans out of the loop. I built a similar website a couple of years later with just a third dimension, literally just adding Z. It wasn't very creative. I just wanted to see if this would work with 3D objects that could be 3D printed. And it turns out it does. You get these nice re repeated um, vertebra with variation in some of the segments. You get things that look like man-made and natural designs because uh, Synthetic designs also use regularity. So you see have things that have rotational symmetry. You have faces, mushrooms, chess sets. All these amazing designs pop out just with these little simple networks being evolved by people. I then wanted to see could it design robots, kind of like Carl Sims, if you're familiar with that video. So we took these four materials here, two different oscillating muscles, and hard tissue and soft tissue. There's no brain here. There's just an open loop um, cycle. And then I challenged evolution. You'll have more kids if you can walk. You can move far. And evolution was able to use these networks, these CPPN networks, to produce this total diversity of very different ways to solve the problem. And I've actually challenged engineers to try to build walking creatures in the system, and they can't do it. 
it's too entangled, it's too messy, the human brain doesn't deal well with this design space, but evolution has no problem producing this kind of parade of fun, interesting creatures that run across the thing. And I've got, this, is, this goes on for five minutes, but I don't have the time to show you the whole video. But again, to go back to this issue of generative encoding versus direct encoding, if I directly encode this, it's a mess. Every voxel is independent. I don't have contiguous patches. And you can see the performance difference is quite substantial. All right, that was bodies, images, and objects. But what we're really interested in is artificial intelligence. So how can I use the same property to make neural networks? So uh, this is my 10 second int uh, introduction to neural networks. In your head is a lot of complexity. Apologies to the biologists in the room. You have a lot of neurons, and they're connected to each other. And what's connected to what and how it's connected effectively determines whether or not you have an epiphany today, or love Shakespeare, or love Van Gogh. This is what's going on. So we're going to take all the complexity of the brain and reduce it to just neurons and whether, and whether or not they're connected to each other. There are weights on these connections that are either positive or negative, and they have a multiplier. So this neuron is taking signal from these neurons, and it goes, you know, it's like I said, it's neurons all the way down, all the way back really to the input. Ignore the chemical aspect of the brain? That is a debate that's raged for decades. Um, you can do a lot with this simplification, and the question is whether or not you can do it all, and that is an open, ongoing, active area of research that I will not get into today. But uh, much ink has been spilled on that question. So let's see how far we can get just with neurons. All the deep learning stuff I just mentioned, by the way, all has this level of simplicity. They're not doing any of the chemicals uh, diffusion. All right, so remember, we want to use this CPPN network here to have the phenotype be a function of its geometric location. Well, it turns out that's not too hard in a neural net because I have a connection that starts here and ends here. There are coordinates to this point. There are coordinates to this point. I'm literally going to take those four numbers, put them into the network, and ask what this connection should be. And then I can do that for the next network, which has slightly different coordinates, which produces a slightly different output from that function. And I can iteratively do that for all connections. And what we want to see is whether or not this network can paint regularities, patterns in neural connective tissue space, and whether or not that regular, those regular patterns produce intelligence or better behavior. To compare it, I'm going to have the direct encoding, which is literally just a number for each one of these weights. So the same brain, same expressive power, I'm just encoding it differently, and mutations will affect connections separately over here. The problem I put it on, I put it on quite a few, but I'm only going to show you one, and that's having this simulated table robot learn to walk. And the reason that's an interesting problem is because there's a lot of regularities here. There are four legs, and I want them to be coordinated. And once again, the generative encoding, which is hyperneat, performs significantly better than the direct encoding. But it's more interesting to actually watch these behaviors evolve and see what happens. So this is generation zero. A random brain produces random mo motions. But one of the brains in that population could make one hop. So evolution seized on that. Uh, five generations later, evolution has got it, these networks to produce Two hops, not too impressive. But if you let this run overnight, and you wake up in the morning, and you turn on your screen, and you see what evolved, you get to see a rather nice set of coordinated behaviors evolve. Now, there's no human in the loop here. This is just simulated evolution. And the CPPN has produced this kind of regular controller that has all four legs acting in unison. It's like a, a toddler. A little sure. Boy who, he was trying to do a That's right. In fact, I have a little toddler, and that's what she does right now. She just rocks back and forth. With all, there's coordination there, but not much, not much more so far. Um, the direct encoding, in contrast, which doesn't look like a toddler, at least not my toddler, um, is totally uncoordinated. So I have no idea what that leg's doing, like flapping in the breeze. Uh, oftentimes, in some of these videos, you'll have two legs that are literally like trying to go in the opposite direction because they're not coordinated. It looks like, like some Jim Carrey movie where they're fighting with each other. Uh, Etc. So here's another gate that came out of the CPPN generative encoding. Now we have three legs operating together and one leg operating out of phase. So it's, re it's re repetition with variation. It's still coordinated, very functional. That was actually the highest performing gate. And with a keystroke and no blood, which is nice, you can look at the brains of these organisms and see what they look like. So here are the direct encoded networks, and they look like a random mess. Every connection is doing its own thing. Here are the generative networks that have these nice regular patterns to them. Thank you. So here are these cool um, kind of red on top, green on bottom motif that's repeated throughout this brain. And different runs of evolution will produce different patterns. So here is kind of left-right symmetry. 
here's diagonal symmetry, here's one column being accepted. So all these cool different geometric patterns in neural connective space. And what's nice is you can actually look at these and guess what the behaviors are without too much practice. So this one is a left right symmetric gate. This is the brain that had one leg that was out of phase, etc. You can look and see how the wiring correlates to the behavior, which is pretty nice. So I get to Cornell and there's this 3D printed robot on the shelf and an undergrad says he wants to see if my work will work on a real robot. So I said take Hypernate, put it on the real robot. And this was actually a test bed. Many other machine learning algorithms have been put on this robot and Hypernate instantly produced the fastest gate that had yet been seen and so far to date has been seen on this kind of test bed example robot, which was nice. All right, so that's a regularity. Now, how do we get modularity? Well, modularity, to define it, is the location, localization of function in an encapsulated unit. So in your car, it's not one giant integrated part. You have a muffler, you have a wheel, you have a spark plug, a transmission, etc. And designers know that modular designs help with adaptability. Because I, for the next model year, I can keep some of the parts, swap in a new module, maybe recombine the modules in a slightly different configuration. And that allows me to rapidly adapt designs. And the same thing is thought to be true in nature. For example, in your body, you have organs, separate integrated units. You're not just one blob of primordial cells talking to each other. And so we think that modularity is a key to nature being more complex and more adaptable. But, and this is rather sad, whenever we evolve neural networks in these computational simulations, they never turn out to be modular. We've wanted it for decades. There's been this quest. How do we make neural nets evolve to have modules? Because we think that that's so important. And people have spent a lot of time working on it. And um, if you get the exact conditions right, once in a while you can get it. But it's very difficult and it tends not to work very well. So we thought maybe evolution is not going to produce modularity because it's beneficial in terms of long-term evolvability. This is kind of a lesson from my mutation rates paper. Maybe something else is causing the modularity to appear. And uh, I actually read this book, in this 2005 book by George Strider, a neuroscientist. And he hypothesizes maybe modularity doesn't evolve because it's a good idea for adaptation. Maybe it evolves because connections are expensive and module, modular designs don't have many connections. So I said, well, I should test that. And so uh, the problem we test on is this problem from Cashton and Alan. It's like a little visual problem. You have to recognize whether or not something's on the left side and the right side, and then you have to tell me if they're both there. And it turns out there's two ways to do that. You can either have one integrated function that does both at the same time, or you can first solve the left problem and the right problem and then put the answers together. And here is the summary of the paper all in one slide. This is in Proceedings of the Royal Society a few years ago. If you take this problem and you select for performance alone, you get non-modular networks. This is what we've been doing for 40 years in our field. And if you take these networks and you put them in a new environment, they're very slow to adapt. However, if you do selection for both performance and you just put a little penalty for each connection, so you have a connection cost, like a switch, you suddenly get these nice, beautiful modules emerging in these networks. And this solves the left problem, this solves the right problem, and then they put them together. Now, if you take these networks and you put them into a new environment, evolution just rewires these building blocks very rapidly to cause them to adapt to new problems. So here's a lot of the data. This is without a connection cost. This is with. You can see modularity goes up over time with a connection cost, and it stays flat without it. And this is performance. So you also get a significant performance improvement. Now, many people are not used to seeing results where evolution would do better if it took this route, but it doesn't take it. Um, and that's basically, again, this short-term, long-term thing. In the short term, there is not a gradient towards modularity. There's a lot of a gradient towards entangled networks. Anyone who's ever written software knows that in the short term, I don't want to have nice factored modular code. I just want that variable. I want access to it now, and I just put make spaghetti code. But that turns out to not be very adaptable and usable. If there's a pressure, like a boss, who makes you have a, a modular a factored code, then you get more performance and you get more adaptability. So the real question is how it overcomes this short-sightedness. Well, you add a penalty for connection costs. And in nature, in the physical world, there happens to be that penalty. So how fortuitous for us in nature that there was this cost that we were ignoring for a long time, but if you put that in, suddenly you get these benefits. So I've told you about modularity and regularity. Can we put them together? Turns out you can. If you take Ken's CPPN hypernet algorithm, add the connection cost, which I just showed you, you end up getting networks that are both regular and modular. You get significantly more modularity, regularity, and they're significantly higher performing. This was the work from my first PhD student, 
uh, at the University of Wyoming. One more thing that I'll say on modularity is that there's this problem in neural networks called catastrophic forgetting, which is if I take a network here and I train it on a red problem, it can learn the red problem pretty well. Then I take it and I put it on a new problem, say the yellow problem, and there's no pressure to remember the red information. It will immediately just start using all of its connections to try to solve the yellow problem. Therefore, it will have lost the ability to do the red. That does not happen with you. If you learn how to play chess, and then you learn how to go ride a bike, you still know how to play chess. You didn't cannibalize those neurons. So they, uh, natural organisms forget gradually. Uh, neural networks forget catastrophically. We wanted to know whether or not modularity might help because I could learn the red task in the red module and the yellow task in the yellow module and not interfere with each other. And this is a paper that will come out in about two to three weeks in PLOS Computational Biology. Basically, we found that if you add a connection cost to networks, not just while they're evolving, but also while they're inside their life learning different tasks, you get higher modularity and you get higher performance. Now, the story is not as clean as this beautiful separation into yellow and red. It's much more messy in the paper, and we could talk about that if you're interested. But you do have some evidence for this hypothesis, and we do know that modularity is helping with catastrophic forgetting, which is a, an important thing to overcome. All right, so the final of the trio is hierarchy. How are we going to get that into our networks? Well, it turns out, we were thinking, uh, maybe we already have the answer in front of us. So hierarchy is the recursive composition of lower level units, as you know in an org chart of, for a military or a company. And we think that it's an important principle in brains. It also doesn't show up in neuroevolution by default. We've wanted it for a long time. We couldn't get it. But if you think about it, hierarchy, networks that are hierarchical are sparse. They have very few connections. Most things aren't connected to other things. And they're composed of nested modules. So we thought maybe the connection cost will get us hierarchy too. So we have a whole new paper that we just submitted uh, last week. And basically, it turns out that that's true. If you add a connection cost, you get more hierarchy. If you uh, quantify it algorithmically, you also get more modularity. You get higher performance. And you see, can see the difference here. This is on this problem. That's actually one of the justifications for hierarchy in social systems, that it cuts down the, the messy cost of too many people talking to each other. That's right. That's right. And so a lot of people, like in road networks and social networks and things that are, are human-made, they have kind of speculated or even known for a while that costs are promoting this structure. Uh, no one had really tested that in an evolutionary context before this paper, and it turns out that a physical cost for connections also causes evolution <laughs> to choose this hierarchical structure. Yeah? Well, we haven't been able to test it very well until the last two, three years. That's, that's one of the challenges, especially those that didn't have supercomputers. That's right. So this is, a, a lot of it, as you say, has been known for a long time. In fact, almost everything that you're saying today is where I've lived for a long time. That's good to know. You, you, I mean, the, the ability to demonstrate it like this is fantastic. Yeah, I think it's great. I think it's an excited, exciting time because you can basically ask open questions in evolutionary biology in these simulations and start to experimentally do things that you know, were impossible. In E. coli, I can't change the cost of connections and see whether or not my bacteria evolved to be modular or not. Not just because the time scales are long, but because I don't have that control experimentally. But in these simulations, you have full control, full data, and you can have generations, thousands of generations overnight. So it's a nice way to be able to test these questions. By the way, are, what are you using? Is it up in your lab, I think? Or? Yeah, so um, some of the work, well, um, most of the work that I'm showing you here uh, has been done either at Cornell or the University of Wyoming. Um, with the exception of the regularity stuff, which I did during my PhD. All the software is open source and available. Anyone can download it and use it. We do have access to supercomputers. That is one important thing. This is very computationally expensive work. Oh, yeah, up at Wyoming? Yeah, I, uh, my lab uses somewhere between 80 and 90% of the entire machine. <laughs> during my job interview, they're like, what are your computational needs? And I said, infinite. And they thought I was kidding. And then they had to say, um, you can't use the whole cluster. Try to tone it back a little bit. So yeah, very computationally expensive. If anyone has spare computers, I'll take them. Um, right. So one thing I want to point out really quickly is that this was the problem we tested it on. Notice the color coding. These are the intermediate logic gates. I've also color coded these neurons. It's not showing up very well on this projector. But 
Um, if a neuron solves one of those problems, I color coded that. And you can see these networks really are hierarchically decomposing the problem and putting the answers together. And then if you take these networks and you put them in a new environment that's uh, similar but has maybe different logic gates or a different uh, architecture, they're much more evolvable, significantly faster to rewire to solve that new problem versus these networks up here. Even if they start at the same performance, which is interesting. Yeah? A lot of other groups are, are saying, hey, we're, we're, you know, we have the prize on this problem, we're, we're the top on that problem. Whereas you're, you're showing relative uh, costs and improvement. Yeah, there are certain situations where um, if my work takes me close to being able to solve, go after like a benchmark, I will do that. But that hasn't been a primary motivation for me. It's okay. saying I'm the, I'm the state of the art. But it also tends to require a lot of uh, tweaking because you want to beat the other person and you have 0 .3, 0 0.03 less than them, so you spend six months tweaking something that's not generally interesting but might get you that benchmark. So I haven't done a lot of that. But I will show you in part two of the talk, uh, we do have state-of-the-art results in a totally different domain that I'll show you. Uh, and in fact, I'm basically concluding this part of the talk. I've showed you how to get regularity, which is by basing your encoding on developmental biology. I've showed you how to get modularity and hierarchy, which is by adding a connection cost. And that gives you increased performance, evolvability, uh, and those properties. Uh, we've also shown you that we're starting to combine them together. Uh, we're going to integrate hierarchy next. We were adding in learning. And then everything I've showed you is on pretty small scale problems. We want to dramatically scale up the, the complexity of the network and the complexity of the problem. It requires a lot more computation, uh, unfortunately. But we're trying. So part two. Oh, sorry, yeah. So there's some trade-off happening between, uh, as you go through this, these evolutionary generations, between the performance and the cost of connection. Um, did you have to fine-tune that, or I mean, how did that? Sure. Out? Right. So actually, the way that we handle that is a little bit more elegantly than just picking a weighted uh, linear function, because that's fraught with difficulty. There are these algorithms called multi-objective algorithms that basically look for the Pareto trade-offs between so you can specialize all the way on being low connection cost or all the way on performance. And then I want all of the trade-off on that Pareto front between them. And so we use that. And so effectively, evolution is exploring all combinations of those weights at the same time. And then at the end, we have to pick one thing to show off that Pareto front. And usually, we pick maybe the highest performing and then sort by modularity or hierarchy or something. OK, so part two of the talk, which is going to be a lot shorter. Uh, is new work that I have, and all that work was done with a lot of great collaborators, but there was too many different papers to put all their pictures up. But this work is done with these guys here, uh, including long-term collaborator Jean-Baptiste Moret, who's also on the modularity and hierarchy and catastrophic forgetting work. Uh, and this is trying to get robots to recover from damage. So we all want robots to, oh, sorry, I forgot to tell you. Um, two days ago when I made this talk, it was Nature in Second Review. Which I was excited about. But on, literally on the drive down here, I'll check my phone while pulling off on the rest stop. And we got a nice email from Nature that this paper has been accepted. So we're super excited. Tell them how to spell your name while you're at it. Uh, tell them how to spell my name? It's Clune. That's my name. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> nope, it's Clune. Okay. Um, no worries. All right, so we're excited. So uh, we all want ro uh, robots out there in the world that uh, will you know, do our laundry and put our dishes away and go into natural disasters and find survivors and turn the valves on Fukushima to have it stop melting down and do all these things. Um, one of the reasons that hasn't happened yet, and there are many, but one of them that we have to solve before we have robots doing that work is to have them recover gracefully from damage. Right now, if a robot becomes broken, it's usually just worthless, and a human has to come over and fix it. Animals, on the other hand, are surprisingly robust to injury, as you all know. In fact, it takes a keen eye to even notice that this dog is missing a leg, and it's still getting on quite happily. So this is what we want our robots to do if they become damaged. So the current state of the art uh, of robot damage recovery is actually pretty archaic in terms of artificial intelligence. You've got this suite of sensors all throughout your body in the hopes that you have a sensor right where the damage occurs, and you can detect it. And if you can't, you're in trouble. If you do detect it, then you go to this giant library and you pull off some solution that's been pre-programmed by a human or pre-computed by a learning algorithm. And obviously, you can just tell immediately that's not going to scale to real complex robots and real complex situations. 
Um, there are other approaches, such as the ones that I've been mentioning, where you could have a learning algorithm automatically try to learn a new gate after damage. But most of these algorithms are really slow, and they require a lot of physical trials, and they usually would break the robot even further while flailing around and trying to figure out how to walk now that I'm missing uh, a new leg. So what we want to do is try to more emulate what we think is going on with natural animals. So natural animals, they have intuitions about different ways to move. They conduct a few intelligent tests once they become damaged, and then they pick a behavior that works despite the injury. So that's our roadmap. We need an algorithm that will do those three things. I'm going to show you how we do that. So the first thing is I need intuitions about different ways to move my body. I'm going to turn to my old friend evolution because it's good at producing diversity. Except when I showed you the diversity of creatures from that problem, there was one trick. And that is that I had to go to different runs of evolution to get those different solutions. Within one run of evolution, it typically converges onto one design. And there the population is actually relatively homogenous. So Jean-Baptiste and I, we invented a new algorithm that we're writing up right now called Map Elites, which is the multidimensional archive of phenotypic elites. That's a mouthful, but it's actually conceptually very simple. I pick dimensions that I'm interested in. I might have a really high dimensional search space, like the space of all possible neural nets or robot bodies. But I pick a low dimensional space that I'm interested in, such as height and weight, literally discretize that space. And then I'm looking for the highest performing organism at every cell in this grid. So evolution will simultaneously be searching for all these different things. You can think about these as different ecological niches that have been created, where if you're good over here, you're not competing with the organism that's over here. Uh, the algorithm is very simple. I just put an I find out where an organism is located, like randomly generate one, put it in, then pull one out, mutate it, see where it goes, and if it's better than the current occupant, swap it in. That's it. Very simple. Turns out this algorithm is extremely powerful because it not only finds maybe a good performing solution somewhere in the space, but it returns the set of the best things that's found throughout the space. So it really illuminates and paints your fitness space for you. It tells you, for example, that there's no organisms over here that are very powerful, and there's two different bimodal places where you might perform well, and they're very, very different from each other. And you get this whole set of creatures back, or behaviors. So for example, on this soft robots problem, we applied this. And this is what a classic evolutionary algorithm does in this space. The dimensions, by the way, are the number of voxels on the, this axis and the number of bone, which is this blue material, on this other axis. And a classic evolutionary algorithm doesn't produce much coverage at all. This is if you add a little bit of diversity, which is what people have been doing for EAs for decades to produce more diversity. And if you notice, it actually works better. Performance goes up. We know that. But still, it doesn't explore much of the search space. Whereas map elites will basically flood the entire space and show you all sorts of different ways that you can perform well, or maybe the best that you can do up here. So this is our. So just this morning, for time purposes, I deleted. I had a second one to show you. You get a very similar pattern, but it's different. So it's not like it's always giving you the answer. There are still stochasticities in here. But you could run 10 and then combine them. And it's kind of like a fall off in the stuff you haven't found with more runs. But mostly you get the same picture. OK, I don't know if people were watching this, but we have a six-legged robot that we're going to step on to see if it can recover from damage. Uh, and it knows how fast it's going based on this sensor here. So uh, we basically have a six-dimensional space because I want different ways that this robot can move. So I pick the percent of time that each one of the legs is touching the ground. It's so a six ro six-legged robot, so that's six different dimensions. So I'm going to look for a gate that never uses leg one, that uses leg one 90% of the time, 80% of the time, and all possible combinations with all other discretizations of the other legs. So it's a huge space. At the end of the day, we end up with about 13,000 gates, uh, or 13,000 behaviors. And it took 40 million evaluations. So here's where we took the Wyoming computer and just let it run for a long time. But Two weeks of computation only needs to be performed once. Then I can ship that with every version of this robot, and they have this pre-computed map. So this is not something you have to do on the fly when you become damaged or for every, uh, for every deployment. So here's a, a video of some of the things that came out. In this case, this one leg that was circled is only being used 10% of the time. And is then this thing being given a direction, or, or where does it go? Uh, it, we actually did give it a direction. We said, walk that way as fast as you can. Um, and we, you know, we're looking for different types of ways to solve that goal. So this one's only going to use four of its legs. Mo most of the time, these front two legs are going to be off the ground. You get the idea. 
One of the things that I love about evolution is it's creative and it often surprises you. So we left in the case of n none of the legs touching the ground ever. We knew that they would never solve that problem because it's pathological. You can't walk if you don't touch the ground. But lo and behold, evolution surprised us. And it figured out how to not have any of the feet touch the ground <laughs> by doing that. It's just pretty, pretty clever. So how do you visualize the six dimensional space in 2D? We uh, come up with this legend here, which basically, um, if you stare at it long enough, starts to make sense. The general idea is that in this space, you can see there's lots of different pockets of high-performing behaviors, and they're very different from each other. So these ones are going to be very different from these ones. Now, I have my intuitions of different ways to move that are all relatively high-performing, some high, more higher than others. Now, how do I do a few intelligent tests when I become damaged? General idea is I could take the highest performing gate, but I don't know if it's going to work on the real robot. Remember, this is in simulation, and it's on the undamaged robot. So we've got two levels of reasons why this might not transfer very well. Let's assume I test that one and it doesn't work. I could go to the second highest gate, but that might be right there, right next to it. That's not what we want to do. What we want to do is try a whole different family of gates. And so what we use is Bayesian optimization, where the prior is the map of intuitions. And then we update our posterior every time we conduct a test in the real world. So I could basically conduct this test. That doesn't work. Rule out not just that gate, but suppress all the gates nearby as a function of how close they are. Assume that that trial is inf information about those neighboring gates. Jump over here, test that, suppress if it doesn't work, and keep jumping around until I find a gate that's good enough. That's the general idea. And you can actually watch that happen. This was the original map. This is your prior. This is your posterior after about six or seven trials. And we end up finding that this one is still pretty good despite the damage. And, that's the, and then we call that good enough. Specifically, our stopping criterion is if the one I just tried in the real world is at least 90% of good as anything I haven't tried yet, I'm going to call it good. But that's an arbitrary threshold you could pick. This reminds me of, of suboptimal problems in hill climbing. Yep where you want to jump around and not just stay in the neighborhood. Totally. That's right. The question is, how do you do that in an intelligent way? And we think Bayesian optimization is a pretty clever way to jump around that space. So this is a combination of evolution and Bayesian optimization. So let's see if it works. Here's the um, classic hexapod gate, hand programmed. This is what you send out to Fukushima. Somebody steps on the robot by accident. Now it has a broken leg, and that original gate no longer works. Uh, the original speed was 0.25 meters per second. We're now at 0.3 meters per second, and it's a curved trajectory. No good. So now let's kick our algorithm off. We take this map, pick the highest performing place in the map, run it. It doesn't work very well. So it's hard to tell, but we're actually going to suppress the performance nearby that gate. And then balancing explo exploration and exploitation, we're going to jump around the space, trying to pick different families or different types of, of walking. Now we've got one that's 0.17. It's a little bit straighter, still not very good. We'll suppress those, jump to a new remaining peak. Now we're at 0.2. Uh, and look, this we actually have the wall clock up here. So far, only 27 seconds of real time have passed in terms of these trials. Now we have a gate that was 0.24, very, very close to the original. But we still, there might have been a better one over here. We try that. Turns out that wasn't as good. We'll then go back to that previous one and say that was the best one we found. We don't think there's anything better. We're going to settle on this and call this good. And we basically recovered right almost to the original speed. If you watch it in slow motion, to me it looks like an animal. It looks like we are capturing some of nature. So here is, uh, to me it looks like a crab that somebody like, it has like a broken leg. And we posted this on archive and somebody found it in supplementary material and posted it and started spreading it around. And all sorts of comments started flooding in saying that we were being cruel to robots and that we should be nicer to them. <laughs> Which is the first time I've really heard a lot of sympathy being expressed for robots. Although I imagine that that will only increase. So um, this, you know, there's legions of supplementary material for this work. We've tried it on many different damage conditions. And basically, in every case, you can look. The number of trials is very small. We're talking about 10 trials. We're talking about one to two minutes to basically recover almost to original performance in many different situations, even when you have two broken legs. Uh, and we've did it with many different ways, d definitions of the dimensionality of the map, including randomly picking those dimensions. We basically poked and prodded this algorithm in every way possible, trying to break it to make it nature-proof. And that worked, which was nice. We also put it on um, 
a different robot, which is an arm, and you bro if you break some of it, like up to two of its motors, it can still basically find a way to take the ping pong ball and put it in the basket. I was yeah. just going to say the obvious part here is that already you look like you're surpassing the, the physics of this. I mean, the, the physical robot. Uh, so, you know, being able to plug it in and, and uh, choose uh, different uh, legs and different, being able to plug in different things, it looks like you're just about there. Yeah. One of the things I didn't mention, which is pretty cool, is that even if you actually don't use it in damage, just to search, it still provides usually a better gate than most state-of-the-art uh, learning algorithms because it crosses the reality gap and it figures out dynamic ways to move this body that might not have been found by other learning algorithms. So just right out of the box, it's a pretty uh, handy algorithm, which is kind of nice. That developmental psychology. How so? That's, that's what you're doing. Developmental psychology. I see. That's right. Yeah, we do want to emulate the good stuff that's happening in humans and, and robots. All right, so let me conclude because I know people are going to have to go soon. Um, if for this project, we think we've got state of the art. So here's your, uh, your, your benchmark here. We think we have state of the art robot damage recovery. Uh, in about two minutes, you can step on a robot and beat it up pretty bad, and it will kind of try a few different families of ideas and get up and limp away. Uh, and it does that by using map elites to build this huge map of prior intuitions, uh, then Bayesian optimization to do different types of tests, and then just picking the one that works well. So my final slide is that the overall quest for my lab and my research career is effectively how to figure out how evolution produced complexity and intelligence. I'm really fascinated by that biological question, both because I want to harness evolution, but I also want to understand it. But I also just want to make artificially intelligent robots. And I'm a little bit, on that front, agnostic on the tools. I'm willing to use evolution, but also deep learning and Bayesian optimization, because I just think it's really fun and fascinating to try to recreate artificial intelligence. Thank you.